there. Welcome to uh, part two of chapter five, cell membrane and transport. So we left off talking about uh, some diffusion and different parts of transport and the creation of gradients. We had uh, solute gradients and of course that ion chemical gradient. And these gradients are created um, through a form of uh, either passive transport or what's known as active transport. So in this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about the different types of transport as well as some of the different ways that uh, this transport is carried out. So first off, we have passive transport. Uh, passive transport does not require any kind of input of energy. Now we know that energy is, in the cell is in the form of ATP. For the most part, uh, GTP is another molecule used for uh, for energy by the cell and in passive transport we're not going to be using any of those. So we have two basic forms of passive transport. We have passive diffusion where a solute itself can pass through a membrane uh, and it does not require any kind of protein to carry it through. So this would be like when we looked at the the um, slide that had the picture of the membrane and the levels of permeability. In this case, in passive diffusion, this would be your CO2 or oxygen, nitrogen, those gases, anything that can freely move across the membrane itself. It will do so in, um, in the direction of its concentration gradient. So when you think of a concentration gradient, think of a hill. Let's see if I can get the pen uh, working here. We'll just use a highlighter. So think of the gradient as a hill like this. And up top here is a high gradient. I'm just gonna put an H. And down here is a low gradient. And in the case of our solutes, our solutes are gonna move against, or I'm sorry, with their concentration gradient. They're gonna roll downhill. And it, think about a ball rolling downhill. It doesn't take any energy to do that. In facilitated diffusion, we're going to have diffusion of the solute through the membrane, but in this case, it has to do so through a, uh, through a protein. So this would be for a larger molecule, say water or um, glucose, something like that. There's going to be some type of protein, excuse me, that is going to allow for the movement of that molecule across the membrane, but it has to move through the protein. So it will be moving in the same direction as we show up here where I wrote with the highlighter here, this little gradient here. And it's going to move from high concentration to low concentration. It's just going to have to do so through some type of protein, right? So here's a P for protein. And it has to, um, it has to move through the protein itself. So it can't just um, roll freely. So here's an example of diffusion. We have a high concentration of solute on the outside and then a lower concentration inside. So in this case, our solute molecules are gonna freely pass the membrane. This is passive diffusion. Here in the bottom, we have um, some type of transporter protein. And again, we're moving from high concentration, right? This area down into this direction see the arrow, uh, but we're going to move from high concentration to low concentration, but it cannot do so freely across the membrane. It can only do it through the channel, through this um, transport protein here. So that's known as facilitated diffusion. It's still diffusion because we're going from high to low gradients, but we're having to use a protein. We have to facilitate that diffusion through a protein since the solutes can't move freely. That brings us, diffusion brings us to the terms of tonicity. You probably have, have heard of these, you already know what they are, but we're going to review them real quick. When diffusion is occurring, um, it's going to occur in different solute concentrations. So if a solution is isotonic, meaning um, we have the equal amount of, of solute concentration inside of a cell as well as outside or on both sides of the membrane, then the diffusion of solutes in either direction is going to be equal. So in an isotonic solution, we're at equilibrium. In a hypertonic solution, um, the concentration of the solute is going to be higher on one side of the membrane than the other. So if we have a membrane here and I have a high concentration on this side and a low concentration of solutes on this side, then I'm, this environment over here is going to be hypertonic. So in this case, my solutes are going to move to the left. Now, if I have a hypotonic um, concentration, that's where the concentration is lower uh, and on one side of the membrane than the other. So in this um, example up here at the top, on the right is hypertonic and 
on the left is hypotonic. They both start with the same letters, so that makes them a little... So we'll put an E here, right? Hyper and hypo. So here's just a kind of a schematic giving you the same example. At the top here, we have the equal number of um, red dots on the outside of the cell as we do on the inside of the cell. Here, in a high, if our cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, then um, in this case, the concentration of solutes is higher outside than inside. This is going to cause water. Since the concentration of solutes is over here, think about this for a minute. This is going to change the water concentration. So in movement of water, which is osmosis, um, in this case, in a hypertonic solution, although our solutes may move into the cell, if they're able to move into the cell, let's see if we can get a different color here. Um, let's go with blue. If um, uh, solutes, excuse me, are going to move from left to right, they're in the hypertonic situation there, they're going to move into the cell, then our water is going to move out. Now in the case of a hypotonic solution, uh, the water concentration out here is higher because the solute concentration is lower. So in that case, water is going to move into the cell and our solutes are going to move out of the cell. When that occurs, up here at the top, our cell is going to go through a process known as crenation. I can't write on this slide very well. All right, so crenation. And here in a hypotonic solution, with all this water moving into the cell, our cell is going to go through what's known as lysis, which means it's going to fill up so much with water that it's going to lice open. It'll break. Think of overfilling a water balloon, right? So you're filling a water balloon up too much. So we just talked about osmosis here. Here is where um, osmosis is just the diffusion of water. So if solutes are moving in one direction, water is going to be moving in the other. If you think about it real quick, let's just put a little membrane up here. So here's our membrane. If this is an 80% glucose solution, right? So let's say this is 80% glucose. 80%, that means only 20% of this is water. Over here, I have a 50% glucose and a 50% water. So in this case, my glucose molecules are going to move from high concentration to low, right? So this is my diffusion, put the letter D here, and then my water is going to move in the opposite direction. So my water is going to also go from high concentration to low, but that's in this side, right? So this is my water. So water moves in that direction. So water diffuses the same way that solutes do. We just call it osmosis when it's water. If the solutes can't move, however, because our cell membrane is semi-permeable, if the, if the solutes are too large or charged, there's no transporter protein, if they're incapable of moving back and forth across the membrane, water is still going to either enter the cell or leave the cell. Um, and this is referred to as osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure is the tendency for water to move into a cell and increase the turgor pressure of that cell. Um, and so the cell gets tighter, the membrane gets tighter because it's filling up with water. So animal cells have to maintain some type of balance with their outside environment. Otherwise, the cell's either going to crenate or lice open. So here we have in this diagram, here's your isotonic solution. If we add, if we put these cells in a solution of pure water, because the inside of the cell contains solutes and no solutes cannot freely move out of the cell from high concentration to low in order to try to equilibrate the, uh, the two systems, then water is just going to keep moving in. And because we're in pure water, there's no solutes outside of the cell and only inside of the cell, they're never going to reach equilibrium. So water will just continue moving into the cell until eventually the cell lyses open and breaks. The cell membrane is only so strong.
The exact opposite happens if we put our, um, our cells in a hypertonic solution. So in a hypertonic solution, we would have too many solutes outside of the cell and the cell does not contain enough water to equilibrate that concentration. So water just keeps moving out of the cell and eventually the cell will shrivel up and crenate and, and, uh, and die because it loses too much water. This is why in um, uh, intravenous fluids, when you go to a hospital and somebody's on an IV, the IV is actually salt water. It is a 0.98% sodium chloride, and it's referred to as saline. And the saline has just enough salt concentration that it is isotonic with our blood cells and in our bloodstream so that we don't introduce pure water into the bloodstream, which would cause our cells to possibly lice open and dilute. Uh, dilute the bloodstream too much or um, something with too high of a salt concentration which would draw all of the the water out of our red blood cells and cause them to crenate so we use um, a saline solution which is again 0.98 percent sodium chloride and that saline solution is isotonic to the uh, cytosol of our cells and so that keeps them the movement of water equal and gives us an isotonic environment now, plant cells go through the same process, uh, but the difference is that a plant cell has a cell wall and animal cells do not. So in uh, plant cells, in a hypotonic solution, we get um, uh, the solute concentration, of course, is lower outside of the cell, um, and so it starts to swell up, and we get an increase in what's referred to as turgid pressure. But if we put that plant cell in a hypertonic solution, Instead of crenation, what we get is a process known as plasmolysis. And so plasmolysis is when the cell membrane actually, the cell itself is crenating. You can see that occurring here, but the cell wall is a rigid structure. So the cell membrane um, shrivels up and the cell shrinks inside of the cell wall. This decreases the strength of the cell wall and causes plants to wilt. So when plasmolysis is occurring, right, plasmolysis is occurring, our plant cells are going to weaken and get kind of mushy, and this causes them to melt. I'm, I'm sorry, to wilt, not melt, to wilt. But if we have a lot of water added, then you can see this cell here, how rounded and pushed against the walls it is. The, this central vacuole fills up with water. That increases the turgid pressure and the size of the cells and the tension in the cells. And this causes the, the plants to stand straight up and to have um, proper turgid pressure. So here we can see on the left a cell that has water-filled vacuoles because it has plenty of water and water's moved in. And over here on the right, we have a plant that has lost too much water and plasmolysis, of it, plasmolysis is occurring and it is beginning to wilt. So that brings us to um, the different types of transport that can occur. Um, in transport proteins, I should say. We have two classes of uh, proteins that are used for transport of solutes across a membrane. We have uh, transport channels and proteins called channels and proteins called transporters. Channels are pretty straightforward. They just are proteins that form an open passageway that allows the free flow of solutes across. So they just kind of open up. Usually they're bound by one or two of the actual molecules trying to move themselves at a certain concentration. And when that concentration gets high enough, they bind to the channel, causing it to open, and this guy will move through. So these guys can diffuse freely across this channel. So it's just creating basically a hole in, of some sort um, uh, uh, in, the, in the cell membrane. Aquaporins are an example of a channel because this channel opens up. Aquaporins are used for the movement of water. If we need to really get a lot of water in and out of a cell, uh, transport proteins or channels referred to as aquaporins uh, will open up and allow uh, the free movement of water. Most channels are either gated, and when they're gated, they're opened or closed. So here we have the um, five different types of channels or gated channels. The first is ligand gated. Uh, Non-covalent binding occurs between the protein and some ligand itself. Now this is not the same as a ligand binding to a receptor. Here the ligand is binding to a cell channel. And so the, 
that it's not sending a signal to the cell, it's just opening up this channel because the concentration of that ligand is high enough that the cell needs to start transporting it in, inwards. So think of the top membrane here as um, the extracellular surface, and here we have the intracellular surface. So in ligand-gated channels, we just bind some kind of molecule. This is um, uh, used in the drug industry quite a bit. When we need to move gradients across cells, they will actually create drugs that work as ligands to help open up channels. Then we have what are referred to as intracellular regulatory uh, protein channels. And here we also have non-covalent binding. And we have a protein that's found inside of the cell, and the cell senses that there is something outside that it needs. So this regulatory protein will um, bind to this channel and open it up. The production of these regulatory proteins, since we've already done some cell signaling, think about it. Uh, think of an RTK pathway. So we may have that um, RTK gets, gets uh, signaled and it uh, goes through that MAP kinase pathway and it activates a transcription factor inside of the nucleus. That transcription factor is turn maybe, maybe, turning on a gene for a regulatory protein. That protein will then exit um, out of, uh, will be produced, right? So the mRNA leaves the nucleus, it becomes a protein, and that protein then comes and finds a channel, binds to that channel, and opens it up. That would be the cellular response. Then we have, have uh, phosphorylation channels. Here, instead of a ligand or regulatory protein, ATP may be used or another protein may transfer a phosphate group to the channel in order to open it up. Uh, the phosphorylation pathways are used a lot in signaling pathways. And you can think about that like a kinase cascade. They're basically just passing phosphate groups around like hot potatoes. Then we have what's called a voltage-gated channel. In this case, there is no binding of a molecule. It's not, there's no ligand or protein or phosphate group. Nothing is binding to it. What's happening is ions are building up on one side of the membrane and not on the other. This is referred to as a membrane potential. So one side of the membrane may be more negative than the other or more positive than the other, but there's a charge difference across the membrane. And when that charge difference reaches a specific threshold, an electrical threshold or charge threshold, it will cause the channel to respond by opening or closing. And then we have mechanosensitive channels. These are used in some of our sensory organs, uh, in particularly in the ears. So the sound waves, actual physical uh, sound waves cause changes in the membrane tension. Think of cochlear cells in the ears. And this causes uh, changes and this can cause channels to open or close. This is one of the ways that the cochlea in the ear converts sound waves into a chemical signal that can be sent to the brain for interpretation. Now, transporters are also referred to as carriers. Uh, these guys actually have an active site and go through a conformational change in order to bring a uh, solute across. Uh, they're the primary pathway for the intake of different organic molecules, uh, hormones, neurotransmitters. Uh, we can take in, you can see here a list, we've got amino acids, nucleotides, and in particular sugars. Uh, they're, they have a major role in export. And when the cell is producing waste, many of our transporters are actually used to transport waste out of the cell as opposed to take things in. They're used in the regulation of pH. Remember, pH is just a concentration of hydrogen ions. So these guys can be used to regulate the hydrogen ion concentration and ensure the proper pH. They are also used in maintaining cellular volume in the cytoplasm. So there are three different basic types of transporters. We have uh, uniporters. Uniporters will transport something in a single direction. Many of our um, waste transporters are uniporters. So you can see here the molecule is binding, let's say a solute is binding to this transporter. It causes a conformational change in the transporter that causes it to open up to the intracellular side. It's the only direction in which um, 
uh, it will move something. Once this solute is no longer bound to this transporter, the change in shape that occurs is back to its original shape. So it does not transport anything out of the cell, it only transports transports one molecule at a time into the cell. So it's referred to as a uniporter. A synporter is sometimes also referred to as a co-transporter. In a synporter, two or more different ions are going to be transported, but always in the same direction. So here I have um, uh, a red ion and a blue ion, and the two of these, once both of them are bound to the actual transporter, it causes a conformational change that causes the transporter to drop the two ions into the cell. This is, again, two different ions, but in the same direction at the same time. An antiporter is two or more ions in opposite directions. So our first ion binds to the transporter, causes a conformational change that drops the molecule into the cell. So you can think of that as a uniporter. But instead of transporting, instead of changing shape all the way back to its original, it now requires a second ion that's found inside of the cell to bind to it in order to change shape back to its original, drop that ion outside of the cell, and now we have moved these two ions in opposite directions. Same transporter, but moving two ions in opposite directions. So that's an antiporter. Now that brings us to active transport. In active transport, we have the movement of a solute across a membrane against its gradient. Remember this hill, we had the concentration gradient, right? So this is our concentration gradient. And up here is a high concentration. And down here is a low concentration, right? So we'll put a little down arrow, a little up arrow. And instead of moving with the gradient now, we're going to roll the ball back up the hill. And if you're going to roll a ball back up a hill, up the concentration gradient, you're going to have to put in some energy. So in active transport, we're going to move a solute across the membrane against its gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. This type of movement is what we call energetically unfavorable. So it requires some kind of input of energy. We're not going to be able to, um, to derive energy from it. The two basic forms of this are primary active transport and secondary active transport. In primary active transport, we're going to use um, uh, energy directly in order to transport the solute. In secondary active transport, we're going to use some kind of pre-existing gradient, usually derived from diffusion, um, and we're going to use the energy created from a passive gradient to give us the energy for a, um, for a transport against the gradient. I'll show you what I mean in a second. So here on the left, we have primary active transport. I'm simply just using energy. I have a high concentration of these hydrogen ions outside of the cell, and I'm going to use ATP to energize this protein here, this uh, uh, transporter, to transport the hydrogen ions against their gradient. So I already have a high concentration out here. I need to keep that concentration high. So this is primary active transport. In secondary active transport, since I have created this hydrogen ion gradient out here, I'm going to use that hydrogen ion gradient to carry sucrose molecules here across to an area of high concentration. I have sucrose in the external environment that I want to bring into the cell and convert into glucose so I can use it for energy. Now, I may not have a whole lot of sucrose outside of the cell, and I have a lot inside of the cell, so I need energy to bring over um, those sucrose molecules. Instead of using ATP for every single one of those, I'm just going to use some ATP to, uh, to, uh, to transport a bunch of hydrogen ions and then use those hydrogen ions to bring over the sucrose molecules. So in active transport, we have a couple of different ways that these transporters can work. They're usually referred to as pumps. Pumps are going to couple couple a conformational change because of phosphate being added from ATP to the actual movement of the molecule. So here I have on the, um, this is that calcium ion pump in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that specialized region of the endoplasmic reticulum in uh, cardiac muscle cells. So on the left here we have this calcium ion and we have ATP. 
So ATP is being brought over and a phosphate group will be added, right? Um, will be chopped off that ATP. That's gonna release some energy. That energy is gonna be used by this transporter pump, this calcium ion pump, to transport this calcium ion here against its concentration gradient. I need to build up a calcium ion gradient because I wanna create some type of ion, um, ion electrochemical gradient. So this is an ATP driven pump. The ATP pumps are used in uh, active transport and in a process known as group translocation. So let's take a look at these. ATP driven pumps are used for um, ion electrochemical gradients. We have what's called the sodium potassium pump where three sodium ions are going to be exported out of the cell in order to import two um, potassium ions into the cell. This is uh, done through an antiporter type of uh, pump and it creates an electrogenic, um, an electrogenic, uh, it's, a, excuse me, it's referred to as an electrogenic pump and creates an electrochemical gradient. What it's doing is it's causing the outside of the cell to be a little more positive than the inside of the cell. Cause I'm pumping three positive charges out and only two positive charges back in. So that gives me a, ch a difference or a change of one net positive charge. Multiply this times thousands of pumps in a single cell and you can see that it can uh, very quickly create a large electrochemical gradient or membrane potential across the cell. So here is our sodium potassium pump. Uh, three sodium molecules here are going to bind to this pump. Once all three of them are bound, ATP is going to be used to phosphorylate this pump. The phosphorylation of this pump is the final reaction needed to cause the conformational change for this pump to open to the extracellular environment. When it does, the three sodium uh, ions are going to be released. When they are released, it opens up the active or binding sites for the potassium ions. These potassium ions bind to the cell, causing a second conformational change. That second conformational change causes this uh, uh, transporter here to change shape again back to its original shape, dropping the potassium ions into the cell as well as releasing that phosphate group. This pump is now ready to come over here and start this process all over again. Pump out three and pump in only two. So you can see here on the left, the sodium potassium pump is used quite a bit in nerve cells. So it's used in nerve signaling, that electrical signaling that's required to move from one neuron to another to send signals throughout the body for things to happen. That's a lot of that is happening with these sodium potassium pumps. That brings us to the process of exocytosis and endocytosis. Now, sometimes there are molecules that are so big that they can't necessarily be moved through a protein pump. They actually have to be transported in large vesicles. So think phagocytosis, when cells have to eat things. So in exocytosis, material that's found inside of the cell, either waste material or something that needs to be excreted by the cell for signaling, is going to be packaged in into a membrane bound vesicle. The vesicle uh, membrane will then bind or fuse with the, with the cell membrane and then excrete or release its contents into the extracellular environment. So exocytosis is moving things out of the cell. Endocytosis is moving things into the cell. And when this occurs, the plasma membrane itself is going to create kind of a, it's called an invagination. And it um, folds kind of inwards to form a vesicle and will wrap itself around whatever it is that it's bringing into the cell and form a vesicle in the actual um, cytoplasm or cytosol itself. Uh, and then that vesicle is what brings the substance into the cell. There are three types of endocytosis. One is receptor mediated. Uh, the other is penocytosis and phagocytosis. So in penocytosis and phagocytosis, these are pretty straightforward. Um, the cell membrane either takes in a solid, that would be phagocytosis, so it's, it's something coming in, and this uh, vesicle here would be referred to as a phagosome. 
or it's a liquid. There's some kind of fluid, and that's called penocytosis. That's referred to as cell drinking. So we have both phagocytosis, cell eating, and penocytosis. When these vesicles are formed, there's a class of proteins here. These are called clathrins, and these protein coats kind of attach to the outside of the vesicle, and by these proteins coating here, it's going to tell uh, the cell that this needs to go to the Golgi apparatus for processing. So when vesicles, when any kind of endocytosis is occurring, one of the first places these guys go is into the Golgi for processing, the, the cis end. Now in receptor-mediated cytosis, this is used quite a bit by the um, immune system and a few other cells for um, regulating, again, what moves in and moves out. So here we have receptors found on the surface of our cell, and these receptors will bind to whatever they are specific for. So in this case, it's not just taking in any solute, it's taking in a specific one. And in this uh, cell membrane, these receptors are bound, and when multiple receptors are bound, they come together, and this signals does send a signal to the cell to create this clathrin uh, protein coat and to pinch off this vesicle. So this vesicle only will form if the ligand to these receptors and to multiple receptors are bound. Our immune system uses this for the consumption of bacteria and viruses, that sort of thing. They have receptors, our uh, macrophages and neutrophils and, and such, they have receptors on their surface that will bind multiple um, antigens. And those antigens, once a, a certain number of them are bound, will create these vesicles, move into the cell, and then merge with a lysosome. And this lysosome, will help with, um, as you know from chapter uh, four, that the lysosome will then start breaking down whatever it is um, that's in there. It's one of the reasons that instead of going straight to the Golgi, and one of the reasons it merges with the lysosome instead of going straight to the Golgi, is that this is again used by the immune system. So the cell wants to make sure that it destroys whatever it is it takes in before um, it introduces it into any organelles, just in case it's a virus or a bacteria or something that could be harmful to the cell. So that's it for part two. You've now covered cell membrane and transport. Um, Make sure that you take a look at the essay questions and bring any questions into class that you have so we can review and I can answer them for you. Okay. Have a good one.